بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا واجعل ما نتعلمه حجة لنا لا علينا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين We begin as always with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by sending peace and blessings upon the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and upon his family and his companions and we begin by asking Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to teach us what will benefit us and to benefit us with what he teaches us and to make what we learn stand as a evidence and a proof and a witness for us on the Day of Judgment and not to stand as a witness and an evidence against us. I'd like to thank, or I'd like to start by thanking the brothers and the sisters from Al Muntada for organizing this course, Jazahumullahu Khaira, and the brother, Jazahumullahu Khairan, for his beautiful recitation of the Quran, and all of you, brothers and sisters, who've made the effort to come here today and give up your weekend, which I'm sure is very, very valuable time, to come and to learn something which will be of benefit to you and to others. And I'd like to start, before we even talk about the course, by mentioning the hadith of the waft of Abdul Qais, the hadith of a party or a group who came from the tribe of Abdul Qais to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they explained to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we can only come to you in the sacred months. And you know there are four sacred months in the Islamic calendar in which fighting is prohibited and in which fighting was prohibited in the time prior to the coming of Islam. Minha arba'atun hurum. From the 12 months of the year, there are four which are sacred. And they said we can only come to you in the sacred months. Because between you and us is the tribe of Mudar and there is a warring tribe, they are fighting against us, we can only come to you in the sacred months. So they asked the Prophet wasallam, and they said to him to teach us something that we can go and inform those who we left behind and we can enter by it into Jannah. And Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala indicated that this is the example of the perfect intention. And that this is the intention that all of us should have coming here today. To learn something that we can correct other people by and we ourselves can enter into paradise through it. They ask the best possible intention to correct yourself and others. And that is why when some of the people came to Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, and they asked him about his intention, he said this, to correct yourself and others. So we are here today to do the same. We're here today to learn something through which we ourselves can achieve the paradise that is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and something that we can use to correct other people. And there's no doubt there's a limit to the number of people who are here today. Even if we have 50 or we have 100 or we have 200, whatever number of people there are today. But each and every one of you can take the information that you learn, act upon it in yourself, correct yourselves through it and then start to spread it and to encourage other people to act upon it. And this is how we correct our society and this is how we correct our community. We don't do so in any other way than the way that the Prophet ﷺ did it. In Makkah at the very beginning, started with himself, when he would receive the knowledge he would act upon it and he would begin with the closest people to him and then move outwards and outwards and outwards. And the things that we're going to talk about today are from the most important of things that a Muslim can learn about. And I'm not talking about the jinn or about magic 
But some of the fundamentals of Islam that we're going to talk about today are so important that they are literally the difference between your paradise and your hellfire. And there's no doubt that for many people when it comes to the issue of magic, people enter into things and do actions that would take them outside of Islam and would make them from the people of hellfire that are in the hellfire forever and never ever get out. And so this is something that we want to learn about today to correct ourselves and to correct others. Beginning with the closest people to us and moving outwards. And if every one of you was to go today and correct five people from what you learn, that would be an absolutely huge impact on the Muslim community. Because they will go on and correct five. And if they go on and correct five, before long you have a huge number of people who have saved themselves by the grace of Allah from his punishment by simply people learning and putting it into practice and teaching it to others and then being patient. Because we know that the reality of the situation is when you tell people the truth, not everybody is going to accept everything that you say all of the time. And it's not true that you're just going to go home and you're going to say to somebody who you see has a, an amulet or a ta'weed around their neck and you're going to say to them you should take it off, that they're just going to lift it off their neck and pass it to you. It's going to require patience. And if you think about the Prophet وسلم, and his example, you see that he required an immense amount of patience. More than any normal human being could have possibly achieved. You see that in Mecca, how few people accepted the message. And then you see that he went to Ta'if, expecting the people of Ta'if would welcome him with open arms. And they threw stones at him and they, until they, uh, they, they caused injury to him, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and they uh, called him all of the names that they would call him. And then he was thrown out by his people and forced to emigrate to Medina. And then in Medina, all of the hardship that he endured and the vast majority of his prophethood was an example of people, difficulty and people not accepting. And people accepted towards the very end when Allah Azza wa Jal revealed, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُرُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا When the help of Allah and the victory comes and you see the people entering into Islam in crowds. And regarding this surah, when this surah was revealed, you think it's a surah of happiness. Many of the companions took it as a, a very, very, very sad uh, surah. And many of them were known that when they would hear the surah, they would cry. And they would become very upset. Because they recognized that this surah was the announcement of the death of the Prophet ﷺ. Because every messenger is there to deliver the message. And once the people accept Islam in crowds, that's his job done. And so they knew after this surah was revealed, it would not be long before the Messenger وسلم, was taken from them. However, my point in all of this is that when you are spreading the message to other people, you're not going to find people welcome you with open arms in every instance. And it's not for you to turn your back on them and to ignore them and to build yourself an ivory tower that you can climb up and you can preach from the top of. It doesn't work like that. You have to mix with them, you have to endure the suffering and the difficulty and you have to be patient and that is where your reward lies. So this is one hadith, a hadith of the, the party of Abdul Qais who came and they informed the Prophet Sallallahu of their intention and he approved of their intention to correct themselves and to correct others. And the second hadith that I want to mention by way of introduction is the hadith of Hudayfa radiallahu anhu. Hudayfa was the secret keeper of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was the companion who was entrusted with the secrets of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and was entrusted with the names of the Munafiqeen and so on and so forth. Hudayfa has a beautiful hadith in which he said, the people used to ask the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about good. And I used to ask him about evil out of a fear of falling into it. And that's because today we're going to talk about some things that are evil. 
and that are absolutely beyond, I mean, they're beyond evil, they're beyond what a person could comprehend. I mean, you can think of the most evil act that a person can do, and I would think that a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today would exceed your worst expectations, or would go beyond the worst thing that you could imagine. And we don't mention these things, some of the people get confused and they say, why do you mention these things? Why share this knowledge with people? Why not conceal this? Why tell people about what it is that magicians do? Why tell people what the meaning of the ta'weed and the amulets are? Because of the hadith of Hudayfa. That I, the people used to ask the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about everything that was good. How do we achieve paradise and how do we uh, better ourselves and how do we improve and how do we make Allah happy with us? And I used to ask him about the evil out of a fear of falling into it. And so knowing the evil is an important part of Islam. Not so that you can practice it and not so that you can implement it, but so that you know what to avoid. And if you didn't know what to avoid, then you wouldn't be able to avoid that evil that is waiting for so many people and that evil that so many people become involved in and become engrossed in. So those two hadith by way of introduction to correct our intention and to uh, bear in mind the reason why we're going to mention some of the things that we're going to mention. There are going to be things that I say that perhaps not everybody is going to agree with. And that's fine. I don't have any problem with that. But I would ask that one of the house rules is if you do disagree with something, please do disagree with good etiquette. And that, that, that goes just as much for if it's something that I say or something that another person uh, from the attendees makes a point of. If you do want to disagree with something, that's absolutely fine. Um, we're going to talk about what you should and shouldn't disagree with in a moment. But if you do so, please do so with good etiquette. And let's make this gathering a gathering that is based upon knowledge. We don't want it based upon gin stories. We don't want it based upon hearsay. We want it to be based upon firm knowledge, something that you can really hold on to. And likewise, as we mentioned, please don't keep this knowledge to yourself. Don't make it something that you benefit from. And then you sit at home and it's something you've learned and you don't act upon. Put it into practice, teach other people, refer other people to the videos, refer other people to the website and so on and so forth. Um, in terms of uh, just getting that over and done with uh, right now, um, it's probably useful to, to mention that I have a website. It's not a particularly good website, but it is a website. And it is uh, muhammadtim.com, M-U-H-A-M-M-A-D-T-I-M.com, M-U-H-A-M-M-A-D, so Muhammad with a U at the beginning and an A at the end. TIM.com and on there you will find a whole bunch of articles, um, resources and likewise you'll find contact details um, and information about Rukia and other things. Uh, so that is there for you as an additional resource as well to, to, to further add to the information that we're going to give you over the next two days. So in terms of the theoretical aspect that we're going to cover, we're going to begin in a moment with an introduction to the topic and indeed we're going to begin with some fundamentals of Islam. And these fundamentals of Islam are in essence, in, in all honesty, I can be, 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 be completely honest with you and say that the fundamentals of Islam we're going to talk about are the absolute most important thing you're going to learn in the next two days. And the success or failure of any rukia that you do or any case that you treat will be absolutely and solely rest upon the, what you have learned in the fundamentals of Islam, the, the concept of relying upon Allah, trusting upon Allah, turning to Allah, repenting to Allah. These are fundamentals that we can't, uh, we, we, we can't underestimate. I mean, they're absolutely... Uh, they're absolutely vital to, you know, to, um, uh, to the work that you do and to the ruqya that you do. We're going to talk about, um, uh, we're going to talk about the jinn as a the from a theoretical point of view and who the jinn are and what the jinn aren't. Um, the idea behind that is that almost everything we're going to talk about over the next two days is going to be related to the jinn in some way or another. And because it's going to be related to the jinn in some way or another, 
we need to understand who the jinn are and who the jinn aren't in order to be able to understand the kind of effects that they might have upon a person and how these interactions may happen and what the kind of result might be. We're going to talk about magic and the magician and I have some uh, videos to show you inshallah ta'ala uh, regarding some of the things that magicians do and get up to and I really want you to understand this in detail. I want you to come away from today with a very very detailed understanding of how it is that magicians perform magic and how you can recognize a magician from a raqi or from a healer or from a pious person how you can actually recognize a magician and then probably going into tomorrow because i don't think we will manage to fit this in today we're going to talk about amulets talismans and magical symbolism so we're going to talk about amulets, ta'weev, tama'im, the things that people hang around their necks and around their wrists and around their cars and, and in their homes. And we're going to talk about magical symbolism, the kind of symbols and writings that magicians use in order to seek help from the jinn and how you can recognize them and how you can come to understand them. We will briefly touch upon the evil eye, inshallah, at some point. And then we want to get into the practical stuff. And in terms of the practical stuff, we have two sessions, and that is going to be relating to the Raqi and his family, as in how should a person who wants to treat somebody who is uh, afflicted by one of these things, how should that person be in themselves and in their family? How should the patient be? What kind of uh, characteristics do you need to find from those people in order to be able to get a successful outcome to the case that you're treating and then to talk about Rukia as a cure for these kind of problems and how you would go about it. Again, the emphasis here is not to turn everybody in this room into a full-time Raqi, a full-time healer, a full-time you know, person who's out day in, day out just dealing with people who have gin problems. I don't think that that's practical. What we want to do is to encourage you to be able to do this or use this treatment for yourselves, your children, your families, your friends. And then there will be individuals amongst you who inshallah will take it further and will start to sort of help people that are outside of their you know, social group or outside of the people that they mix with on a regular basis. So that's kind of what we're going to cover over the next uh, few lessons. The notes I'm going to give you are going to be the same notes that I used for the full uh, course, the, the, the longest version of the course, so there'll be a lot of additional information in there that I will skip over if I think it's not strictly necessary to mention, and you can read about it in the notes, inshallah. So we have a few introductory principles to mention in the next sort of 20 minutes or so, and then we'll spend a half an hour talking about the fundamentals of Islam, inshallah ta'ala. So one of the things that I want to begin by talking about is uh, some important principles that relate to the unseen. Because a lot of what we're going to talk about today is going to be about the unseen or relating to the unseen. The world of the unseen. And you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions belief in the unseen as being a fundamental part of the character of a Muslim. And that is at the very beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, just after the end of Al-Fatiha, Allah describes Al-Muflihun, the successful. And Allah begins the description of them by saying, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ Those people who believe in the unseen. Those people who believe in the unseen. So your belief in the unseen is a fundamental part of who you are as a Muslim. And the reason I begin by mentioning this is for two reasons. Uh, but one of them I want to highlight here. And that is that as science develops, there is a, a, a vein or there is a, a group of people who are nominally attribute themselves and, and uh, sort of uh, affirm Islam for themselves. They consider themselves to be Muslim. However, their shaitan has hold of them in a certain way. And that is that as they increase in their knowledge of science and their knowledge of the world, they begin to disbelieve in the unseen that is mentioned in the Quran. And not just the jinn, I'm talking about from many, many aspects. And this takes away from a Muslim and can take away from them to a point of leading them out of Islam. So we want to make it clear 
that whatever knowledge Allah has given us is a blessing and there's nothing wrong with science. But we don't want to be from those people who Allah said about them. About whom Allah said in Surah Al-Rum, they know a huge amount of the apparent nature of this world. You know, they know a lot about science, they know a lot about, them, about the, the, the apparent nature of this world. But when it comes to the hereafter, they are ignorant and unaware of the hereafter. We don't want to be like those people. So yes, we have learned a great deal and Allah has blessed us with a great deal of knowledge that we didn't have before. But this knowledge does not contradict the Qur'an. And if it is contradicting the Qur'an, then science is wrong and the Qur'an is right. And that should be a basic principle that we have. And that is something that in all honesty shouldn't surprise you. Because science changes on a frequent basis. You see that 200 years ago the ideas that scientists had that were groundbreaking you know, that had never been known before, have since been proven to be wrong and have changed and the theory changes. Science is based upon theory and it's based upon observation and it's based upon things that are not relating to, to, to the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about in the Qur'an. As for the knowledge of Allah in the Qur'an, it is absolutely perfect. Yes, it may be that we misunderstand something from there, but in the majority of cases, if you find a... Um, a, a clash between what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you particularly in the matters of the unseen particularly in the matters of the unseen then then you should be taking what you find in the Quran as being the absolute truth and whatever else you have either it's been misunderstood or it's uh, talking about something different or there's some kind of misunderstanding there or some kind of kind of error there but the Quran in the knowledge of the unseen that the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ gives us, this is something that we must take and we must base our belief upon. Our only source of knowledge regarding the unseen is the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Allah is is the one who alone knows when the hour will come and he is the one who sends down the rain and knows what is in the wombs and Allah say, tells us that no soul knows what it will earn tomorrow and no soul knows in which land it will die. Indeed, Allah is all-knowing and all-acquainted. So Allah is the one who has knowledge of the unseen. And so if we want to know about the world of the jinn or we want to know about the world of the angels or we want to know about Allah and how Allah is and we want to know about the day of judgment or we want to know about the punishment of the grave or we want to know about the hellfire and paradise all of these things the only source we have is the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam and we should in this be very careful to avoid taking this knowledge from so-called holy people from dreams from inspiration because then we become no different to the Christians and the other people who base their religion upon matters that are, you know, if you ask them about the Bible, they say this was inspired to us. You know, it's a book which has, is full of errors, full of contradictions, full of mistakes. And yet when they read it, they say, yeah, this was inspired to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. This is not what we base our religion upon. Inspiration or dreams or feelings or this is just what I feel is right. If we want to talk about something that is from the matters of the unseen, we need to talk about it from the basis of the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we must be very careful to stick with or to stick to the limits of that which Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have told us. However, there's no doubt that when it comes to matters of Ruqya, experience is going to play a part. When we're talking about the jinn, if you've been dealing with cases of people that have jinn problems for the last 20 years or 15 years or 5 years or 2 years, you're going to have some experience. You're going to have some knowledge that relates to your experience and uh, it, it relates to a theory you have or it relates to something practical that you found out. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, what we want to do is to distinguish between those things that are proven and those things that are theory. And many people who fall into errors in Ruqya and errors with the jinn and errors in regards to their belief uh, with uh, or their belief in the jinn, their belief in magic, 
generally it comes from this. They've taken a theory that somebody has, one of the scholars of Islam or one of the writers who has written on the topic, and they've taken this theory to be the same as the Quran and the Sunnah. And that's not true. Whatever I suggest to you today from my personal experience, from a theory that I have, from my practical knowledge, I'm going to try to make it clear to you that this is something that I'm telling you from experience, from th it's a theory I have, it's an idea I have, and that is something that you are open and free to disagree with, and to challenge, and to come to a different conclusion regarding. As for the matter of the Quran and the Sunnah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَدَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, it's not for a believing man or a believing woman if Allah and His Messenger have decided a matter that they should have any choice about the matter. When Allah and His Messenger speak, you don't have a choice. You don't have the right to say, I disagree, I agree with this, I think... If you hear something from the Qur'an or from the Prophet wasallam, you only have the option to say Sami'na wa ata'na We hear and we obey. As for what I suggest to you from my personal experience or one of you says I, my thoughts are this, my experience is this, I found this to be beneficial then this is something you can take, you can benefit from but please do not make it equal to the Qur'an and to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in this regard, we will mention that you guys will all have your own experiences. Many of you will be coming here today having had or currently going through an experience relating to the jinn or relating to magic, relating to ruqya and so on and so forth. And therefore, that we want to hear those experiences from you. We want to benefit from you. Uh, and we want to learn from your experiences and how you dealt with the matter or how you're dealing with it now so that we can all benefit from that inshallah bearing in mind that we're going to differentiate between what is proven in the Quran and the Sunnah and what is a matter of experience and theory the last point that I want to make in the introduction relates to a particular problem that I think uh, is very prevalent when it comes to these, this particular topic in Islam and that is that a lot of people belittle the topic. They make it something very insignificant. They say, you know, this should just be left to the reciters of the Quran. This isn't the job of a, you know, somebody who's a serious student somebody who's learning Islam, leave this to, you know, the, leave this to the Imam in the Masjid, don't, you know, don't burden the people this is something that is very insignificant. Don't waste your time reading on people. Most of them are mentally ill. Most of them don't have any real problem. Don't bother to read on them. Don't bother to recite Quran for them. Let them just go to their local qari in the masjid and he can read for them. And then you won't have to busy yourself with this. And I hear this a lot. And therefore, we compiled a, a list of virtues of being involved in this particular science and this particular field uh, in order to explain to people that it is an extremely, extremely virtuous field to be involved in and an extremely important one. Firstly, the person, and we're going to use this as a theme throughout our talk, the person who is involved in helping people to overcome the problems of black magic and the jinn and so on and so forth, is a person whose primary job is to call people away from the worship of other than Allah to the worship of Allah. And this was the job of every single prophet and messenger. So by doing this job, you are doing the job of the Prophet ﷺ. Because your first role and your first job, your, the most important thing you do is to take people out of worshipping other than Allah and out of trusting in other than Allah 
and out of relying upon other than Allah and out of going to magicians and out of having amulets made and out of seeking help from the shaitan, calling them away from all of those things and calling them to trust in Allah alone, to rely in Allah alone, to make dua to Allah alone, to seek help from Allah alone. And this is the most fundamental job that the Prophet ﷺ did. And Allah says, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ We sent to every nation a messenger saying, Worship Allah and avoid everything that is worshipped besides Him. Many, many people who will come to you or will seek your advice after you've been to this course, and we'll say, I have a problem, my family has a problem, my daughter has a problem, my son has a problem, my mother has a problem, my wife has a problem. Many of these people will have gone through a phase where they have sold their religion in order to try to seek a fix from other than Allah. By going to a magician, by having an amulet made, by seeking help from the jinn, by putting things, and even some of them will have made sacrifices to other than Allah. Some of them will have committed acts of worship and done those acts of worship to the shaitan, knowingly or unknowingly. Many, many people will come to you in this situation. In fact, uh, we probably find that, that most of the people who come, not all, but most of the people who come to us, will have gone through a phase where they will have sought a cure from something which would take them outside of Islam if they knew the reality of it. And subhanAllah, as the person who is giving people advice in this regard, your job is to take people away from worshipping other than Allah and to attach their heart to Allah alone. Not to attach their heart to you, that I am a, a, I'm a Raqi, I'm a reciter, I can help you, but to attach their heart to Allah and to take them away from worshipping the slaves of Allah to worshipping the creator of those slaves, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what some of the companions said in their da'wah. They said that we've come to call you min ibadatil ibad ila ibadati rabbil ibad. We've come to call you from worshipping the created servants of Allah to worshipping the Lord of those servants. The Lord of that creation. And that is your job. And from this we can see the Prophet ﷺ said to Ali ibn Abi Talib an, Go in peace until you arrive in their midst. And Ali was a commander in the battle. He said until you arrive in their midst. Then call them to Islam and inform them of their duties to Allah in Islam. By Allah, if Allah was to guide a single person through you, it would be better for you than the red camels. And the red camels were the best of wealth that was known to the Arabs at that time. The best form of wealth that you could have, the most, uh, the highest and, the, and the, most, the most prestigious wealth that you could have, it's better for you that Allah guides one person through you. So how about if you become a source for guiding many hundreds and thousands of people? But inshallah ta'ala, by beginning with yourself and your family and your friends, and then because they tell other people and they tell other people, you end up being a source for correcting many, many, many people. It's better than everything you could amass in this world. And so it is a hugely virtuous thing to engage yourself in calling people away from magic and the magicians and calling people away from seeking help from the jinn and calling them to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and to make their religion for Allah azza wa jal alone. The second virtue is that the person engaged in ruqya is the one who is engaged in reciting the Quran and the remembrance of Allah. However much you recite the Quran, and this is something almost all of my Rukia patients say. They say we never used to recite the Quran like we recite the Quran now. Some of them are reciting Surah Al-Baqarah twice a day. Some of them are trying to recite Surah Al-Baqarah three times a day. Some of them are reciting, you're talking about five, seven, ten Jews of the Quran a day. Because of their treatment and because they are treating other people. And they're engaged in remembering Allah in the morning and remembering Allah in the evening, and they remember Allah when the shaitan touches them and afflicts them. So they've gone from being a person whose heart is dead, who is not remembering Allah, who doesn't read the Qur'an, who doesn't act upon the Qur'an, who doesn't think about Allah, to a person who is reading the Qur'an all the time, 
who is reading the Qur'an more than anything else that they're doing. And a person who is engaged in the remembrance of Allah in the day and the night. And that is a huge, huge virtue. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, الذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات Those people, those men and women who remember Allah frequently. For them, Allah has prepared forgiveness and a great reward. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Shall I not inform you of the best of deeds and the purest of them with your Lord? The deed which is better for you than spending gold and silver, and is better for you than meeting your enemy, striking their necks and them striking yours. They said, Yes, O Messenger of Allah. He said, The remembrance of Allah. And the virtue of the Qur'an, that whoever reads a letter of the Qur'an, gets 10 rewards with it. Alif, Lam, Meem is not a letter, but Alif is a letter and Lam is a letter and Meem is a letter. Imagine how much reward that person is getting. And I'm just talking about the patients who are treating themselves. Now imagine that you go and help other people, you help your family members. You go and visit your relatives who have certain problems and you go and help them as well. You're engaged your day and your night in the best of deeds that is better than sadaqah and better than fighting in the way of Allah. That you're remembering Allah in the day and in the night. The Raqi is the one who spends his time helping his brothers and sisters who are in need. And the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever relieves from a believer some grief in this world, Allah will relieve for him some grief in the hereafter. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah will help his servant as long as his servant helps his brother. So if you want the help of Allah, and you want to be relieved from the trials of the Day of Judgment, then help other people. And this is from the greatest of means that you can use to help other people. That you go and you tell them about the Qur'an. And it doesn't have to be that you even read on them. You may just go and give them some advice. Someone comes and says, you know, my daughter's really sick, the doctor can't find anything wrong. And you, ju you just hear them and you just simply say to them, have you tried reciting Al-Falaq and Al-Nas over her in the morning and the evening? SubhanAllah, one small piece of information you gave them, and it may be that this is a means for Allah to relieve from you a punishment or a trial on the Day of Judgment. And then all the time in our life, we're desperate for the help of Allah. We desperately want the help of Allah. And Allah said, Allah will help his servant as long as the servant or to the extent that the servant helps his brother. So as much as you're engaged in helping other people, Allah will help you. If you want the help of Allah, go and help other people. The person engaged in this field is a mujahid who is fighting in the way of Allah. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala said, For the Raqi is a mujahid for the sake of Allah, and this is from the greatest forms of jihad. So he should be careful, lest the enemy overcome him by his sins. He also said, it's not right that someone is scared of learning the knowledge of Ruqya and practicing it. Okay, bear in mind, it's not right that a person is scared of learning this knowledge and practicing it. Because it is an act of worship and jihad for the sake of Allah the Exalted. The servants of Allah who stick to his limits are within the safekeeping of Allah, his protection, his care and his preservation. And then he said, the prophets and the pious people who followed them fought against the enemies of Allah from the jinn and the men and repelled them with whatever permissible means they were able. And they would remove the jinn from the bodies of people as Isa and our messenger of Muhammad wasallam did. The purpose of jihad is to make the word of Allah the highest and the word of who, those who disbelieve the lowest. The Raqi is the one who puts himself in danger fighting against the shaitan to achieve this aim. So you now are engaged in a battle against the shaitan. To repel the shaitan, to make the shaitan's word the lowest, and to make the word of Allah the highest. And when you see what the magician does, the magician does the exact opposite. The magician lives to make the word of the shaitan the highest, and to debase and to disgrace and lower the word of Allah. And that's why they stamp on the Qur'an, and they put the Qur'an in the toilet, and they do all of the things that we're going to learn about in the magic course. They do it to lower the word of Allah and raise the word of the shaitan. The person engaged in this field is a person who strives to make the word of Allah the highest and to lower the word of the shaitan.
And the shaitan is the greatest of the disbelievers. And the Raqi is amongst the most deserving of people to being or to be from those people who the Prophet ﷺ said, and from my ummah are 70,000 who will enter paradise without any reckoning or punishment. The Prophet ﷺ described them with a description that suggests that they are those people who have perfected their trust in Allah and their worship of Allah alone. The Prophet ﷺ said they are those who do not seek ruqya and they do not heed omens and they do not get cauterized and upon their Lord they trust. And this hadith doesn't mean it's forbidden to seek ruqya, and we're going to talk about that later, but it means that the better level of a believer, the higher level of the believer, is the one who trusts in Allah alone and who takes responsibility for these things himself, trusting on Allah Azza wa Jal, doesn't believe in omens, doesn't have anything that lowers his reliance in Allah. And the most deserving of being from those people are those people who learn about this field because when you learn about it, you realize that the shaitan is incredibly insignificant. And you don't need to uh, seek, you know, to go out and to go from person to person saying, help me, help me, help me. In reality, you realize that by relying upon Allah and by doing the things that Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded, then this is enough for you. And by doing this, you are uh, from the most deserving of people to being of being from those 70,000 who will enter paradise without any punishment and without any reckoning or any account. So these are just some of the points that serve as an introduction to the topic.